Chapter 23 I wish Bob Ewell wouldn't chew tobacco, was all Atticus said about it. According to Miss Stephanie Crawford, however, Atticus was leaving the post office when Mr. Ewell approached him, cursed him, spat on him, and threatened to kill him. Miss Stephanie, who, by the time she'd had told it twice, was there and had seen it all, passing by from the Jitney jungle she was, Miss Stephanie said Atticus didn't bat an eye, just took out his handkerchief and wiped his face and stood there and let Mr. Ewell call him names wild horses could not not bring her to repeat. Mr. Ewell was a veteran of an obscure war. That, plus Atticus's peaceful reaction, probably prompted him to inquire, Too proud to fight, you nigger-loving bastard? Miss Stephanie said Atticus said, No, too old. Put his hands in his pockets and strolled on. Miss Stephanie said you had to hand it to Atticus Finch. He could be right dry sometimes. Jim and I didn't think it entertaining. After all, though, I said, he was the deadest shot in the county one time. He could... You know he wouldn't carry a gun, Scout. He ain't even got one, said Jim. You know he didn't even have one down at the jail that night. He told me having a gun around's an invitation to somebody to shoot you. This is different, I said. We could ask him to borrow one. We did, and he said, nonsense. Dill was of the opinion that an appeal to Atticus's better nature might work. After all, we would starve if Mr. Yule killed him, besides be raised exclusively by Aunt Alexandra, and we all knew the first thing she'd do before Atticus was under the ground good would be to fire Calpurnia. Jim said it might work if I cried and flung a fit being young and a girl. That didn't work either. But when he noticed us dragging around the neighborhood, not eating, taking little interest in our normal pursuits, Atticus discovered how deeply frightened we were. He tempted Jim with a new football magazine one night. When he saw Jim flip the pages and toss it aside, he said, What's bothering you, son? Jim came to the point. Mr. Ewell, what has happened? Nothing's happened. We're scared for you, and we think you ought to do something about him. Atticus smiled wryly. Do what? Put him under a peace bond? When a man says he's going to get you, looks like he means it. He meant it when he said it, said Atticus. Jim, see if you can stand in Bob Ewell's shoes a minute. I destroyed his last shred of credibility at that trial, if he had any to begin with. The man had to have some kind of comeback, his kind always does. So if spitting in my face and threatening me saved my Ella Ewell one extra beating, that's something I'll gladly take. You had to take it out on somebody, and I'd rather it be me than a house full of children out there. You understand? Jem nodded. Aunt Alexandra entered the room as Atticus was saying, We don't have anything to fear from Bob Ewell. He got it all out of his system that morning. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Atticus, she said. His kind do anything to pay off a grudge. You know how those people are. What on earth could Yule do to me, sister? Something furtive, Aunt Alexandra said. You may count on that. Nobody has much chance to be furtive and make em, Atticus answered. After that, we were not afraid. Summer was melting away, and we made the most of us. Um, of it. Atticus assured us that nothing would happen to Tom Robinson until the higher court reviewed his case, and that Tom had a good chance of going free, or at least having a new trial. He was at Enfield Prison Farm, 70 miles away in Chester County. I asked Atticus if Tom's wife and children were allowed to visit him, but Atticus said no. If he loses his appeal, I asked one evening, what'll happen to him? He'll go to the chair, said Atticus, unless the governor commutes his sentence. Not time to worry yet, Scout. We've got a good chance. Jim was sprawled on the sofa, reading Popular Mechanics. He looked up. It ain't right. He didn't kill anybody, even if he was guilty. He didn't take anybody's life. You know rape's a capital offense in Alabama, said Atticus. Yes, sir, but the jury didn't have to give him death. If they wanted to, they could have gave him 20 years. Given, said Atticus. Tom Robinson's a colored man, Jim. No jury in this part of the world's going to say, We think you're guilty, but not very, on a charge like that. It was either a straight acquittal or nothing. Jim was shaking his head. I know it's not right, but I can't figure out what's wrong. Maybe rape shouldn't be a capital offense. Atticus dropped his newspaper beside his chair. 
He said he didn't have any quarrel with the rape statute, none whatever, but he did have deep misgivings when the state asked for and the jury gave a death penalty on purely circumstantial evidence. He glanced at me, saw I was listening, and made it easier. I mean, before a man is sentenced to death for murder, say, there should be one or two eyewitnesses. Someone should be able to say, yes, I was there and saw him pull the trigger. But lots of folks have been hung, hanged on circumstantial evidence, said Jim. I know, and lots of them probably deserved it too. But in the absence of eyewitnesses, there's always a doubt, sometimes only a sh the shadow of a doubt. The law says reasonable doubt, but I think the defendant's entitled to the shadow of a doubt. There's always the possibility, no matter how improbable, that he's innocent. Then it all goes back to the jury, then. We ought to do away with juries. Jem was adamant. Atticus tried hard not to smile, but couldn't help it. You're rather hard on us, son. I think maybe there might be a better way. Change the law, change it so that only judges have the power of fixing the penalty in capital cases. Then go up to Montgomery and change the law. You'd be surprised how hard that'd be. I won't live to see the law changed, and if you live to see it, you'll be an old man. That was not good enough for Jem. No, sir, they ought to do away with juries. He wasn't guilty in the first place, and they said he was. If you'd been on that jury, son, and eleven other boys like you, Tom would be a free man, said Atticus. So far, nothing in your life has interfered with your reasoning process. Those are twelve reasonable men in everyday life, Tom's jury, but you saw something come between them and reason. You saw the same thing that night in front of the jail. When that crew went away, they didn't go as reasonable men. They went because we were there. There's something in our world that makes men lose their heads. They couldn't be fair if they tried. In our courts, when it's a white man's word against a black man's, the white man always wins. They're ugly, but those are the facts of life. Doesn't make it right, said Jim stolidly. He beat his fist softly on his knee. You can't convict a man on evidence like that. You can't. You couldn't, but they could and did. The older you grow, the more of it you'll see. The one place where a man ought to get a square deal is in a courtroom, be he of any color of the rainbow, but people have a way of carrying their resentments right into the jury box. As you grow older, you'll see white men cheat black men every day of your life, but let me tell you something, and don't you forget it. Whenever a white man does that to a black man, no matter who he is, how rich he is, or how fine a family he comes from, that white man is trash. Atticus was speaking so quietly, his last word crashed on our ears. I looked up, and his face was vehement. There's nothing more sickening in me than a low-grade white man who'll take advantage of a Negro's ignorance. Don't fool yourselves. It's all adding up, and one of these days we're going to pay the bill for it. I hope it's not a new children's time. Jam was scratching his head. Suddenly his eyes widened. Atticus, why don't people like us and Miss Mottie ever sit on juries? You never see anybody from Makem on a jury. They all come out from the woods. Atticus leaned back in his rocking chair. For some reason, he looked pleased with Jim. I was wondering when that had occurred to you, he said. There's lots of reasons. For one thing, Miss Mottie can't serve on a jury because she's a woman. You mean women in Alabama can't? I was indignant. I do, because it's to protect our frail ladies from sordid cases like Tom's. Besides, Atticus grinned. I doubt if we'd ever get a complete case tried. The ladies would be interrupting to ask questions. Jim and I laughed. Miss Maudie on a jury would be impressive. I thought of old Mrs. Dubose in her wheelchair. Stop that rapping, John Taylor. I want to ask this man something. Perhaps our forefathers were wise. Atticus was saying, With people like us, that's our share of the bill. We generally get the juries we deserve. Our stout make -em citizens aren't interested in the first place. In the second place, they're afraid. Then they're afraid why, asked Jim. Well, what if, say, Mr. Link Diaz had to decide the amount of damages to award, say, Miss Maudie when Miss Rachel ran over her with a car. Link wouldn't like the thought of losing either lady's business at his store, would he? So he tells Judge Taylor that a man can't serve on the jury because he can't serve on the jury because he doesn't have anybody to keep the store for him while he's gone. So Judge Taylor excuses him. Sometimes he excuses him wrathfully. What'd make him think either one of them had stopped trading with him? I asked. 
Jim said. Miss Rachel would. Miss Maudie wouldn't. But a jury's vote is secret, Atticus. Our father chuckled. You've many more miles to go, son. A jury's vote's supposed to be secret. Serving on a jury forces a man to make up his mind and declare himself about something. Men don't like to do that. Sometimes it's unpleasant. Tom's jury show made up its mind in a hurry, Jim muttered. Atticus's fingers went to his watch pocket. No, it didn't, he said, more to himself than to us. That was the one thing that made me think, well, this may be the shadow of a beginning. That jury took a few hours. An inevitable verdict, maybe, but usually it takes them just a few minutes. This time, he broke off and looked at us. You might like to know that there was one fellow who took considerable wearing down. In the beginning, he was raring for an outright acquittal. Who? Jim was astonished. Atticus's eyes twinkled. It's not for me to say, but I'll tell you this much. He was one of your old Sarum friends. One of the Cunninghams? Jim yelped. One of... I didn't recognize any of them. You're joking. He looked at Atticus from the corner of his eyes. One of their connections. On a hunch, I didn't strike him. Just on a hunch. Could have, but I didn't. Golly, Moses, said... Jim reverently. One minute they're trying to kill him, and the next they're trying to turn him loose. I'll never understand these folks as long as I live. Atticus said you just had to know him. He said the Cunninghams hadn't taken anything from or off of anybody since they migrated to the New World. He said the other thing about them was once you earned their respect, they were for you tooth and nail. Atticus said he had a feeling, nothing more than a suspicion, that they left the jail that night with considerable respect for the Finches. Then, too, he said, it took a thunderbolt plus another Cunningham to make one of them change his mind. If we had two of that crowd, we'd have had a hung jury. Jim said slowly, you mean you actually put on the jury a man who wanted to kill you the night before? How could you take such a risk, Atticus? How could you? When you analyze it, there was little risk. There's no difference between one man who's going to convict and another man who's going to convict, is there? There's a faint difference between a man who's going to fit, convict and a man who's a little disturbed in his mind, isn't there? He was the only uncertainty on the whole list. What kin was that man to Mr. Walter Cunningham, I asked. Atticus rose, stretched, and yawned. It was not even our bedtime, but we knew he wanted a chance to read his newspaper. He picked it up, folded it, tapped my head. Let me see, he droned to himself. I've got it. Double first cousin. How can that be? Two sisters married two brothers. That's all I'll tell you. You figure it out. I tortured myself and decided that if I married Jim and Dill had a sister whom he married, our children would be double first cousins. Gee, Minetti, Jim, I said when Atticus had gone. They're funny folks. Do you hear that, Auntie? Aunt Alexandra was hooking her rug and not watching us, but she was listening. She sat in her chair with her work basket beside it, her rug spread across her lap. Why ladies hooked woolen rugs on boiling nights never became clear to me. I heard it, she said. I remember the distant, disastrous occasion when I rushed to young Walter Cunningham's defense. Now I was glad I'd done it. Soon as school starts, I'm going to ask Walter home to dinner, I planned, having forgotten my private resolve to beat him up the next time I saw him. He can stay over sometimes after school, too. Atticus could drive him back to old Sarum. Maybe he could spend the night with us some time, okay, Jim? We'll see about that, Aunt Alexander said, a declaration that was, with her, was always a threat, never a promise. Surprised, I turned to her. Why not, Auntie? They're good folks. She looked at me over her sewing glasses. Jean Louise, there is no doubt in my mind that they're good folks. But they're not our kind of folks. Jim says, she means they're yappy, Scout. What's a yap? Ah, tacky. They like fiddling with things. Fiddling and things like that. Well, I do too. Don't be silly, Jean Louise, said Aunt Alexandra. The thing is, you can scrub Walter Cunningham till he shines. You can put him in shoes and a new suit, but he'll never be like Jim. Besides, there's a drinking streak in that family a mile wide. Finch women aren't interested in that sort of people. Auntie, said Jim, she ain't nine yet. She may as well learn it now, 